Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. This is a tragedy, but it's not a crime. That quote is from Captain Jeff Ferry, the lead investigator searching for missing Texas college student Jason Landry. Jason, a student at Texas State University, left his apartment late in the evening on December 13th, 2020 to return home to Missouri City, Texas for a quick visit. But Jason never made it home. Shortly after midnight, his car was found crashed and abandoned on a desolate road near Luling, a small town only about 30 minutes away from where he started. While Jason was nowhere to be found, he left several disturbing items behind. After two years with no sign of Jason, the Landry family is questioning the investigation and wondering more and more if this tragic accident was actually foul play. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Jason Landry. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us once again. This story is one that's been requested by our listeners a few times. It's very similar to the story of Bryceless Pisa, which we've covered previously. It's a college kid heading home late at night who crashes his car and then disappears. I think I may actually know a little bit about this case. That seems unlikely. The name sounds really familiar. Well, no, I think it's because it takes place in Texas and his name is Landry and we've watched Friday Night Lights a couple of times. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. So it is similar to Bryce Liz Pisa's story, but while Bryce had been driving for many hours prior to his crash and subsequent disappearance, Jason Landry only made it about 30 minutes from his apartment. It also wasn't that long before his car was discovered So it's pretty shocking that he was able to disappear so completely in such a short amount of time. So let's get into it. Jason David Landry was born in Texas on July 29th, 1999 to Lisa and Kent Landry. He's the youngest of three children, two boys and a girl, and he grew up in the Houston, Texas area. The Landry household is one of faith, with Kent serving as the head pastor at Southminster Presbyterian Church. Jason was a good kid who loved music. He was active in his high school band, playing several instruments, like the low brass ones, his mom said. By the time college rolled around, he had set his sights on studying music production at Texas State, which was just under three hours from his home in Missouri City. His freshman year started off as any typical college students, but as he neared the end of his first year, the entire world changed. COVID hit the U.S. in March of 2020, and just about everything shut down and went online. By the beginning of his sophomore year, later that summer, Jason was able to return to campus, and he moved into his own apartment, so he was kind of like, he had his own apartment, which is great, but everything was shut down, and so he was by himself a lot. A lot of his classes were still virtual, and, you know, he and his peers were just generally a lot more isolated due to the pandemic. In an episode of Never Seen Again about this case, Jason's parents said that lockdown and the pandemic understandably affected their son. I mean, you know, it was a difficult time for everyone, obviously. But I think especially for these younger kids who are in these transitional periods in their life. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's supposed to be, you know, uh, your freshman year is supposed to be like crazy. And he did get through most of it uh, before COVID hit. But yeah, his sophomore year started and everything was still shut down for the most part. That's crazy to think about. I mean, you know, we had kids in middle school and like that was traumatic enough. I can't imagine like you're setting out to start your basically adult life 
first time out in the world by yourself and it shuts down. Yeah, exactly. And you're stuck in this apartment by yourself. Yeah, so it's it, exactly. So it's like his entry into adulthood, but like he couldn't do anything and no one really knew how to handle any of it. So Jason, you know, I don't know exactly when, but he began smoking pot. But what's unclear is if this was just like a general college kid kind of way or if this was like something new that he was using as somewhat of a coping mechanism. You know, I don't know. Anything would be speculation, but it does come up later, which is why I, it's important to mention it now. But, you know, while he may have been having a rough time, like he wasn't getting into trouble or anything. He didn't have any arrests or anything like that. He got a ticket for running a red light in October of 2020. That was from what I can find about the extent of it. I bring up Jason's drug use only because it is believed that he may have been under the influence when he stood off on his drive that winter night. Near the one-year anniversary of Jason's disappearance, the Caldwell County Sheriff's Office, the lead investigative agency on the case, released several pieces of evidence that they had gathered. Among that was a screen-recorded FaceTime call that Jason had with a friend shortly before his departure from San Marcos, where his apartment was. Though there's no audio on this tape, the friend said that he recorded it because Jason was so messed up that he, quote, didn't think he was going to remember it later, end quote. The video, which has been released in full, is 38 minutes long. In it, you can see... Jason in his apartment with his phone propped up on a desk or a table, talking to his friend as he rolls several joints and places them in a prescription pill bottle. Jason's wearing a blue-green t-shirt, which he's sweating through. So at one point, he takes the phone with him as he changes into a faded reddish-purple shirt that says Camp Choye and a gray baseball cap. It's clear that Jason's getting ready for his drive home um, because he's, you know, getting ready to leave. He puts on his backpack. He's getting ready to go. It's difficult to assess a stranger's state of mind from a mute FaceTime call, <laughs> but Jason is chatty. I mean, he's talking the whole time and he appears generally upbeat. The call ends as he appears to leave his apartment. So you said the phone call was muted? Yeah. So there's no audio on it. It's just the video. According to phone records and other digital evidence uncovered by investigators, this is what happened next. Jason leaves his apartment at 10.55 p.m. He uses the Waze app on his phone to get directions to his parents' home in Missouri City. The drive should take just under three hours. At 11.07 p.m., Jason continues to drive south on Highway 80, entering Caldwell County. At 11.15 p.m., he passes Texas 130 and drives through several small towns, including Fentress, Prairie Lee, in Stairtown. Then, at 11.24 p.m., Jason enters Luling. He's still on 80, but his route leads him through town, where 80 turns into Austin Street. He makes it to the intersection of Austin and Huckleberry Street, but it's at this point, or right before it, that he receives a Snapchat message, so he switches out of ways into that app. This distraction could be why, instead of turning right onto Magnolia at that intersection, Jason continued straight to Spruce Street, which then turns into Salt Flat Road. Salt Flat Road is a desolate stretch with fields on both sides. There are ponds, oil fields, old wells. It's a dark rural area. It's a dirt road, pitch black. According to Captain Ferry, Jason was likely traveling a little faster than he should have, and the front driver's side wheel went off the road. He then overcorrected and the vehicle went into a tailspin, turning 180 degrees and traveling into the opposite lane facing the opposite direction. The car then continues backwards and strikes a tree uh, in, with the rear of the car. The rear of the car strikes the tree. This impact causes the car to spin once again, and then the driver's side front corner hits a barbed wire fence. Got it. Yeah, so basically, like, he just spun, like, all the way across the road, mm -hmm. hit a tree, hit a fence, came to rest. Now, this accident must have been very scary, but it doesn't seem as though it would have been catastrophic. Yeah, if he had been going crazy fast, then it probably would have flipped the car. There wasn't any blood in the car or anything else that would have indicated that Jason was gravely injured in the crash. 
The car, on the other hand, a 2003 Nissan Altima was definitely totaled. They obviously didn't know this at the time, but the crash is now believed to have happened at approximately 11.34 p.m. About an hour later, at 12.31 a.m., a volunteer firefighter was driving home after a shift when he came across the crash. He looked around for the driver, but didn't see anyone. So understandably, he's alarmed, so he calls 911. Yeah. It takes an hour for an officer to arrive at which point the firefighter fills him in. The officer was wearing his body cam, and that footage has also been released, so we're going to play you a portion of the audio here. This is the officer and the firefighter speaking right after the officer arrives. And I turn around down there, and there's a backpack. All right, let me go take a look. And his backpack is further up there? Okay, so it's in that curve? Yes, sir. I can see where he went sideways. Yeah. That's keys in there, and it's all locked up. Keys are in the ignition, but it's locked up. Right up there is where his shorts and underwear are. He's completely naked wherever he goes. So this is a pretty upsetting scene. Not only do we have a crash in the middle of nowhere with no driver, but the keys were left in the ignition. The, the car- lights were on. The car was locked. The car was locked. The driver's side door was locked. I thought the... Uh- the officer said the car was all locked up. He said it was locked up, but then I read in the report that it was the driver's side door that was locked. So I don't know if it was all or just the driver's side. Okay. Jason's wallet and backpack are left behind. And most disturbingly, his shoes and the clothes he was wearing are strewn across the road near his car. I, I thought the officer also said that uh, the backpack was not in the car. That's right, yeah. His backpack was by a curve in the road. Yep, and so I'll talk about that specifically, like where they were specifically located in a little bit, but yes, correct. His backpack was out of the car, the wallet was in the backpack, and uh, his clothes were strewn across the road outside. It seems that even though this is you know, if I came across this, I'd be pretty freaked out. You know, I'm not a volunteer firefighter or a cop. They seem pretty casual about it on the tape. It seems as though they kind of come to the conclusion pretty quickly that it was a drunk driver who crashed, freaked out, and then called somebody to get a ride. And at that point, they don't, I mean, they do make a comment on the video about, you know, wherever he is, he's naked. But, I mean, they don't really know that because, to your point, it could have just been clothes from the backpack or, or something like that. Or from the car yeah. or whatever. Right. So, you know, I don't know if that if when they said that, they genuinely believed oh, I'm sure there was they, somebody running around naked. No, I'm sure that they didn't. I, I'm sure that they have run across accident scenes like this that that is the result, is that somebody was under the influence and fled, you know, because... Fleeing the scene of an accident is if there's no injuries involved or no other people, it's less bad than getting a DUI. Yeah. Now, coincidentally, you know, even though we're talking about Texas, the area was experiencing a cold snap at this time. So at the time of the accident, it was 43 degrees Fahrenheit or 6.1 degrees Celsius. The temperature dropped throughout the night, though, and by 7 the next morning, it was down to 35 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.67 degrees Celsius. Right, which for Texas is extremely cold. And very, I, and very I, cold. And I remember the, that cold snap happening. Like, that's the thing. So he, he was originally dressed in, you know, shorts and a t-shirt and sandals and then potentially nothing after that. So either way... Not great if you're if you're outside somewhere. The body cam footage shows the officer and the firefighter looking around and finding Jason's backpack and various articles of clothing like we talked about. After a while, the officer just calls and has the car towed and impounded. Around 2 a.m., he also calls the Landrys to let them know that their son appears to have been in an accident. So the car was registered to Kent, so they found his information, called him. Then um, that officer just leaves. But when I say just leaves, I mean exactly that. 
I don't know if it's because he thought that whoever got into this crash might come back and win his clothes, but the officer left all of his belongings in and around the road. What the hell? Really? Yeah. He didn't even like pick his stuff up and throw it in the car? No. That seems weird. Or or, or collect it as evidence or something? Like, no. Because he had to write a report on this. Yeah, for sure. No, I have no idea. And it's like, unless you, it, it's like the only thing way that kind of makes sense, like I said, is if he thought that he would come back for his clothes. But it's like, if you think that some dude is out naked for real in almost freezing weather, then like, I think you have a bigger problem than like making sure he yeah. gets his shorts back. Stick around. Yeah, right. But if that's not what you're thinking, like, yeah, pick it up. I mean, even if you don't think that a crime has occurred, which they certainly did not at this point. No, so they didn't it, necessarily put it think, back in the car. Well, exactly. Right. So they didn't necessarily think, ooh, I need to like preserve this for evidence. Right. But throw it back in the car because, you know, in theory, him or his parents are going to come and pick up the impounded car. Right. You know, once this all gets sussed out. Yeah, exactly. And like, but in like the slides, for instance, we're like in the middle of the road. It was so weird. It's like, I, I could just imagine some tired driver driving down thinking it's like a cat and, you know, swerving and like <laughs> causing getting, another accident. Right? Yeah. That's, that is bizarre. That is really bizarre to not just like pick everything up. Yeah. I thought that was weird too. So Anyway, so Jason's parents have gotten this call at 2 a.m. They're obviously concerned, um, but they don't really know what to think at this point, you know? Right. They start trying to call him, of course, and he doesn't answer. But then Lisa, his mom, realized that they can track his phone with the Find My Phone app. And because, again, when the officer called them, he's like, yeah, I found the backpack, you know, blah, blah, blah. We found all this stuff, but he never mentioned the phone. Mm. So they're thinking that wherever Jason is, he has his phone with him. So they do the Find My iPhone app. Luckily, the phone's still on, still has a signal. They find it, and the location is the tow yard where they impounded the car. So it's in the car. Yes. Or he is in the car. So it's around that time that Kent decides to drive to Luling and see what's going on. As dawn breaks, he arrives at the accident site. So basically, like, he got there at, you know, 5, 5.30 in the morning, something like that, and went to where the car was, but it wasn't open yet. So I guess he went to the police station um, because around 7, whenever the sun was rising, he and an officer went back to the crash site. And Kent takes video of the scene with his cell phone. Smart move. Right. And what he sees is his son's belongings strewn across the country road. What the hell? The next morning, Kent, like I said, is accompanied by an officer and... Presumably not the same no, officer. No, yeah, a different one from what I understand. They find Jason's backpack in that curve like we heard on the video, but... That curve is about 900 feet from the crash site. Is the thought that the curve is where the his tire first went off the road? I don't know because I don't know if it's 900 feet behind, like where, you know, in the direction he was coming from uh, or oh, 900 okay. feet ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm actually not sure. Um, now, this officer takes the backpack in for evidence the body cam footage does show the officer from the previous night. This is also wild to me. Okay. So the officer from the previous night, like went through the bag and that's how he found the wallet. Cause the wallet was in there. That's how he found the ID, blah, blah, blah. And when he called the Landry's to say like, Hey, this car has been in an accident. He told them that he believed their son was under the influence when he crashed because he found narcotics in his bag. So I'm, assuming that's the prescription bottle full of joints that we see on the FaceTime call. Sure. Still no ev evidence there that he was actually under the influence while driving. No, but, but what's given wild... Given that it was in the bag. 
Yeah, but what's wild about that to me is that from what I understand, the first cop didn't even take that into evidence. He oh, just he put let, it back he, in he the back. He left the joints in there too. And it was still there in the morning. <laughs> I love it. So, in addition to the backpack, and only about a hundred feet away from the crash site are Jason's sandals, t-shirt, shorts, socks, underwear, and a wristwatch. Now, again, all of these items were found the night before. The and, o- and they were found the next day. Correct. It, was his wallet also put back in the backpack? I believe so, but I'm not 100%. Okay. So on that body cam footage from, you know, the first night, the officer even remarked that there was some blood on the underwear. But the later report that I read said that it's actually a small smear of blood that was found on the left that was found on the left hip of the shorts. So I don't know if there's blood on the underwear or just blood on the shorts he was wearing or both. But either way, the the officer on site the initial call noticed it and said something and yeah. still didn't think it was important enough to collect anything as evidence right. or, or, or anything. He, he just left everything there. Yeah. I mean, I get it. The vehicle was involved in an accident. So in theory, sure. Somebody should, could have had a scrape or something that bled. Yeah. But still, why? I don't know. It's why just... would you just leave everything where it was. I don't know. It's so bizarre to me. And incidentally, that does that is the conclusion they eventually did come to because there was no blood anywhere else. Um, not in the car, like I mentioned, not on his other clothing. So what they think is that when he exited the car, he either just cut himself like on the car itself or on the tree or on the barbed wire fence. Like it was just a small, small amount of blood. Kent and the officer also recovered a baseball cap, a plastic bag filled with toiletries, and a tumbler with a dead betta fish, which is never explained, by the way. Maybe he was bringing his fish home and the fish didn't survive the crash? I don't know. But it's never mentioned again, so I have, I can't, I have no resolu- I mean, resolution on that. Mildly inconsequential to the yeah. potential crime that happened. So. Sure. It was also later reported that inside of the backpack, he had a laptop, gaming equipment, and just a few other random personal items. I mean, that's pretty standard for a college kid. Yeah, it was like, all normal stuff. I mean, except for the beta fish in a tumbler. But, that's weird. Yeah. But, um, uh, okay, he's going from his apartment to his, his home, his yeah. parents' home, but, you know, he's, what, 20 at this point? 21. Yeah, I mean, like, he has clothes at his parents' house. Well, yeah, and apparently, according to his mom, he wasn't actually coming home for winter break at this point. He was coming home for, like, a day to go see some friends, and then he was going back to his apartment. So, like, this wasn't the whole... His, he had just finished finals, but this wasn't, like, the official, like, I'm coming home for winter break trip. Right, so it makes sense that yeah, he, so he doesn't packed light. have a whole lot of clothes or a whole lot of belongings yeah. that he's bringing with him. Still weird that he brought a betta fish, but again, inconsequential. Yeah. That day, December 14th, Jason was officially declared missing and the search began. Several agencies came out to assist and brought helicopters, drones, and dogs. Local nonprofits, Texas Search and Rescue and Texas EquiSearch also joined in. Sergeant Dion Cockrell told reporters, quote, we're going to keep on searching until we think there's no hope, which could be two days, three days, four days from now. We're going to continue searching until we either find him or find an answer. Unfortunately, no answers would come. So just to clarify the Mm -hmm. timeline. At 11.24 p.m., Jason switches off ways gets that incoming snapchat Snapchat message and then his phone is not used again okay so 1124 is round about the time of the accident well so that's when he's at the intersection so based on the distance between the intersection on the crash site they actually um 
believe that the accident happened at about 1134. So they think it happened about 10 minutes after that. Then that volunteer firefighter came at 1231 on his way. So there was an hour gap between the accident and when the car was found. Right. And when do they begin their search? They don't begin the search until probably the next afternoon, officially. A- right? Afternoon. That's what I'm guessing. So um, his dad and that first officer were there at around 7 a.m. And that's when they were like walking around. Kent's taking video. They're finding all these items. He's Jason is then declared a missing person. And then the search begins. So I don't know logistically how much time that took. Give or take 12 to 16 hours. Yeah, so like it was that day. So I'm I'm thinking if, you know, they went right back to the station after that, it probably wasn't until like late afternoon or, you know, or so before at the earliest. I'm just wondering how how much time elapsed from the accident and whatever could have possibly happened to him to when they began their search. Yeah, so I would say probably you, around 18 hours. Okay. On December 22nd, nine days after Jason's disappearance, Texas EquiSearch announced that they'd be suspending their efforts until law enforcement gathered more information about Jason's whereabouts. Texas Search and Rescue continued, and they covered another 3,500 acres. So when the search did start, even though it had been 18 hours later, it was very intense, and they used basically every tool available to them. But found nothing there was like one dog who thought that they might have it they might have followed jason's scent to an abandoned house nearby but nothing really came of that but that was the only thing that i read at all that was like remotely possibly related to him so two months later on february 26 2021 texas search and rescue began a new three-day search with more than a hundred volunteers They covered more than 31,000 acres on foot and brought in cadaver dogs. They also, once again, brought in helicopters, drones. They conducted water searches and deployed side-scan sonar, but still found no trace of the college student. Early on, one of the theories was that Jason had become disoriented after the car crash and had fallen into a nearby pond and drowned. The pond was searched, but then eventually drained, and other nearby bodies of water were searched as well, Uh, but of course nothing was found. Police strongly believed that Jason was out there in the area near the crash. They just hadn't found him yet. A few specific theories emerged from this, though, the first of which was feral hogs. And I'm chronically online, so I can't mention feral hogs without mentioning the famous 2019 tweet exchange between country star Jason Isbell and some guy named Willie McNabb. And do you have any recollection of this? Probably not. No. Okay. So this was peak Twitter. I also want to bring it up because I'm sure a lot of our listeners who have never dealt with feral hogs in their lives may have the same reaction of disbelief about this theory that a lot of people perhaps had. All right. So first the tweets, then the explanation. So Jason Isbell tweeted, quote, if you're on here arguing the definition of assault weapon today, you're part of the problem. You know what an assault weapon is and you know you don't need one, end quote. To which Willie McNabb replied, quote, legit question for rural Americans. How do I kill the 30 to 50 feral hogs that run into my yard within three to five minutes while my small kids play, end quote. The entirety of Twitter gobsmacked by the specificity of this unlikely sounding scenario immediately started dunking on this guy. But as it turned out, he had a point. An article published in Slate shortly thereafter aimed to educate dummies like me about the feral hog epidemic in the South, which experts have dubbed the pig bomb. (laughs) Like this whole story is really interesting. I linked the article. It's definitely worth a read if you didn't read it back in 2019. But according to a scientist weirdly named John Mayer, who wrote the book Wild Pigs in the United States, Their History, Comparative Morphology, and Current Status, which hell of a book title right there, feral hogs, which 
weigh over 200 pounds generally cause over $1.5 billion in damage annually in the United States. In addition, they kill more people than sharks. Okay, well, that's not surprising. I mean, sharks don't actually kill a lot of people. Yes, according to Mirror, there have been 70 fatal shark attacks worldwide since 2007, but 84 feral hog attacks. Fair. I can't. Fatal feral hog attacks. A lot more than that. Fair. Yes. And as you mentioned, they have also apparently been known to consume bones. Right. Leaving scant evidence behind. So that was an initial theory because there were a lot of feral hogs in this area. And that could be an explanation as to why, even though the search, not even the official search, but the fact that that firefighter got there an hour after the accident. I mean, that's not a long time. So the fact that somebody got there an hour later and didn't see anything, some people thought could be explained by the hogs. Now, Captain Jeff Ferry, the lead investigator on this case, is apparently one of those people. He told reporters, quote, I don't think the hogs are what killed him, but hogs are opportunistic. If a hog encounters a meal, especially in December, I don't think he's going to pass that up, end quote. Sure, I agree with that, that last statement. However, it doesn't explain why he took his clothes off, why he left all of his belongings literally in the road. And you can say he was disoriented from the crash or from being under the influence or whatever, but like... Why would anybody's first instinct be to get out of the car and take all of your clothes off and leave all of your belongings and then just run through a field and then you die and get eaten by hogs like that? That's I there's something missing there for me. Well, I'm glad you asked because I am now here to fill in that blank. Okay. So the other theory that could work either separately or in conjunction with the hogs is that Jason suffered a head injury in the crash and, you know, was disoriented and possibly lost consciousness. Because even though, you know, there wasn't blood, he easily could have bonked his head and passed out for a little while. Sure. Now, the back window of the car was blown out. So after the crash, cold air was just humming into the car. Like the wind was blowing in that direction too, apparently. So if he had lost consciousness, Jason's body could have started going into hypothermia. Mm -hmm. That would have led his blood to go toward the center of his body to keep his systems going. Mm -hmm. So once he came to, you know, he perhaps is again, maybe concussed, maybe disoriented, maybe whatever. Right. But he still thinks, okay, I need to get out of here, right? Sure, Which I think would be anybody's first. Yeah, like, that explains why he got out of the car. Right. All right. So once he came to, he left the car. But he was disoriented, so he didn't grab his phone. But maybe he just did grab his backpack. And it should be mentioned, though, that it turns out the phone, the reason why nobody knew it was in the car is because it was actually in between the driver's seat and the console you know, I like just shoved into that like black hole. Yeah, which probably happened during the crash. Exactly. So yeah, that's the thing. They don't know if it happened during the crash or if it maybe happened like when he was at that intersection and that's why he stopped using the phone um, or whatever it was. But that definitely explains why when he left the car, he didn't grab his phone. So he grabs his backpack, takes off. Once he exits the car and starts walking, his blood, which had kind of pulled in the center of his body, then goes, oh, wait, we're doing stuff. And it goes back out to his extremities. So this causes basically a hot flash. Yeah, it's the first thing you're mentioning is vasoconstriction. This is vasodilation. Exactly. And so he all of a sudden is like burning up. And this leads to a condition called paradoxical undressing. This is when people who are beginning to freeze to death start feeling hot, so they remove their clothes. They often also find places to burrow, and experts say that these locations are often illogical. German researchers described hypothermia victims, quote, in a position which indicated a final mechanism of protection, i.e. under a bed, behind a wardrobe, in a shelf, etc., 
This act is called terminal burrowing. Paradoxical undressing often occurs immediately before terminal burrowing. That same German article states, quote, the final position in which the bodies were found could only be reached by crawling on all fours or flat on the body, resulting in abrasions to the knees, elbows, etc. This crawling happened after undressing as there were abrasions to the skin, but no damage to the corresponding parts of the removed clothing, end quote. So that's an answer. I'm not saying it's the answer. Sure. I mean, it's a good, it's a solid theory. Right. And so, but here I, I agree. And, but here are my, my issues with, you know, both of the, the hogs and the paradoxical undressing. The area in which Jason went missing was desolate, but it wasn't completely deserted. You know, um, there that, uh, Firefighter came an hour before, like apparently right before Jason crashed. Uh, there was a truck driver who had been by. Um, so like people were traveling on this road. I believe there were some houses or farms or something. And so Captain Ferry did say in that quote that I read that he doesn't think that the hogs are what killed him. Although in that episode of Never Seen Again, he did say that hogs have been known to eat prey alive. So if like that's the case, I mean, I have to imagine that either somebody would have heard something perhaps or seen some sort of evidence of that having happened. Yeah. So describe the landscape immediately around the crash scene. Is is this a field? Well, it's like trees on the side of the road and then, you know, then it's property. So then it's like commercial property or farms or whatever. So if he had made it past the tree line. Right. There's low lying brush. Right? Yeah, it's not like a forest. Right. So unless he like curled up next to a pine tree where there's no underbrush and the hogs and he died or whatever and the hogs got him there. It, it, uh, <laughs> My whole thing, even if even if you're dead, and I and I don't mean to be crass about this, but even if you're dead and hogs come along and start eating your body, yes, they can consume the all of the material, but there's going to be blood evidence there. Well, you're right, and that's my point. And they searched so thoroughly that I have to believe that the dogs the or dogs somebody would still pick up on the scent. Exactly. Yes. Right. Or somebody would have seen a massive amount of blood. Right. If he had still been alive. Now, again, it's not going to, you know, spurt or splatter as though he was alive if he if he was consumed post-mortem. But if it happened that quickly, there would still be a large amount of blood within the body that was still liquid. Right. So there would be evidence of that. Yeah, and so I think that, again, that there's just nothing left behind in terms of that just doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, as far as the hypothermia theory, I do think that that's fairly likely, given that his clothes are strewn about. My issue is that they were close to his car, about 100 feet away, and his backpack was 900 feet away. So what that says to me is because obviously, like, your backpack's on over your clothes, so you get 900 feet away and the backpack, you get rid of the backpack and then get go back toward the car and then take your clothes off. Hmm. And then in addition, you know, that article says that terminal burrowing usually happens quickly after the paradoxical undressing. So it would stand to reason that Jason would have been pretty close to his car right. when he started this burrowing. Yet, after two years and countless searches and thousands of man hours, there has been no trace of him anywhere around his car. Yeah. And again, if if we're believing the hog theory post-mortem, that area would have been scoured many yeah. times. Mm-hmm. Now, the third theory, and one that his family is starting to believe more and more, is foul play. 
By the one-year anniversary of Jason's disappearance, his family had enlisted the help of retired FBI agent Abe Pena. Pena founded Project Absentis and, along with his team of private investigators, agreed to help the Landry family pro bono. Pena thought that the police were too quick to dismiss Jason's case as a high college kid who wandered off and succumbed to the elements. He believed that there may be more to the story. Pena told KHOU, quote, If you go down that road in believing that nothing happened to Jason Landry, then you're not going down that road of talking to people, end quote. With that in mind, he forwarded a list of 10 names to the Caldwell County District Attorney. He said that this list contained people he believed may be able to provide information as to what happened to Jason. So who's on the list? And what is, do we have a working theory from him? Not in terms of any specific people, no. Like he did not talk publicly about who was on the list because, you know, it's an active investigation and they don't want to give that away. But Captain Ferry maintains that this theory doesn't work because there is no evidence that Jason stopped his car prior to getting into that car accident. In his eyes, Jason didn't stop, so he couldn't have come into contact with anyone who wanted to harm him. I mean, given just, obviously, just hearing the story and not actually witnessing any evidence, like I would tend to agree with Captain Ferry. Like, what is what is the theory on foul play here? Well, Pena points to the intersection where Landry made the wrong turn. He thinks that it's possible that that's where Jason ran into trouble. Now, he didn't say this specifically, but it seems as though he could be alluding to a carjacking or something of that nature. He said that Jason had traveled home from his apartment on campus twice before without missing that turn. Pena told reporters, quote, we strongly believe that something happened at that intersection that caused him to go down that road that night, or perhaps he was not driving that car that night and someone else may have been driving that car, end quote. I just feel like he's reaching. Well, yeah, and he admits that this is just a theory, but his point and that of the Landry family is that not enough avenues were thoroughly investigated by police. That's fine. I'll give you that, but I, I don't. I don't I don't believe the theory that he was carjacked at that intersection. I mean, okay, he drove home twice before. Probably also using ways, not paying attention to where he was going and just following ways. I, I mean, oh yeah. I mean, I do that all the time. I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've been to the same place 20 times and you use ways every time and yeah. you, you cannot tell me how to get to these places. No, I've got so, I've got my phone to tell me. Like that's it. <laughs> so yeah, no, I and so that to me, yeah, the fact that he'd made the drive and hadn't missed the turn before, like that means nothing to me. Exactly. I missed the turn to my house half the time. Like I have no idea. Right. And he's a twenty one year old kid that yeah. has grown up with GPS being a thing. Exactly. So like he doesn't need to pay attention to landmarks or directions or whatever. Mm -hmm. He just relies on the GPS. So one thing, you know, to go with Pena's belief that the case wasn't as thoroughly investigated as it should have been is the fact that DNA evidence was recovered from Jason's car, but the sheriff's office didn't plan on processing it because they believe that there's no evidence of a crime. Do we know what DNA evidence was recovered? Where? What? The type it was. I'm just assuming like skin and hair because like I said, they have been clear that, that there's no blood in the car. I really wish that that evidence could be tested and that this wasn't a thing, but it it's budget. Yeah, no, it is. It comes down to money. Yeah, and if they don't believe that a crime is even happening, they don't want to waste the money to say like, oh yeah, Jason's hair is in Jason's car. Which is dumb because any any DNA evidence in any any case should be tested without charge to the county or whatever like that. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want to get off on a political rant, but like that's completely absurd that DNA testing costs so much money that police departments just won't test because they can't afford it. It blows my mind. 
So it's not just the DNA testing, though, in this case, because, you know, the other issue with there being no solid evidence of a crime was that police weren't willing or able to get a geofencing warrant, which the family had wanted them to get. Now, geofencing is a tool that can tap around cellular data found near a crime scene. This data is then used to find people who may have been nearby around the time a crime occurred. Now, as you can imagine, this is a tough warrant to get as it can very easily infringe on people's Fourth Amendment rights. The Fourth Amendment is the one that protects citizens from unlawful searches and seizures of their private property, information, or other materials. A Change.org petition was circulated in hopes of obtaining the geofencing warrant, but as Captain Ferry rightly pointed out, a petition won't get the warrant, only a judge's signature can do that. The Landrys have been working hard to keep Jason's name out there since his disappearance, and their efforts have not gone unnoticed. Around this time, the year anniversary, they were able to get the Texas Attorney General's cold case unit to take another look at Jason's disappearance. This is when the Caldwell County Sheriff's Department released all of that evidence, including the FaceTime call and the videos that Kent had taken the day he went to the crime scene. And this whole release of evidence caught Kent off guard like they didn't give him a heads up about this at all. And he told reporters that some of the evidence that they released were things that he had not seen before. He also felt that some of it painted his son in a bad light, telling KXAN, quote, As a former lawyer, I've never seen law enforcement assassinate the character of a victim because that's what Jason is, whether or not, you know, he smoked pod or not or whatever, end quote. And Uh, again, I'm sorry, but it's smoking pot like. Well, yeah. And Captain Ferry agrees like he denies that they were trying to paint him in a negative light, telling KHOU, quote, I don't want to tear the kid down. He smokes weed, you know, like it's not the worst thing he could be doing. Right. End quote. But that is something to consider if you're it's, if you're taking it from the aspect of he's DWI. Right. Exactly. It, right. Like so DWI it's like it's is a not relevant fact. Right. It doesn't it's mean not he's just a bad alcohol. Person. Yeah. It's it's anything else that they could be intoxicated with. Former Texas State Police Chief Howard Williams opines that Releasing this evidence is probably kind of twofold. It was to show that the investigators had, in fact, come to their conclusions based on the evidence at hand and also to maybe drum up new leads. Like if they release a bunch more stuff, maybe somebody will say like, oh, wait, yeah, you know, I know something about this, whatever. Right. And at this point, it's been a year. They don't even know if a crime's occurred. They've had no sign of Jason like. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, and we talk about uh, uh, this uh, all the time. And But usually yes. it's not after one year, it's after 20. Right. And they still aren't releasing And they still anything. aren't releasing it's things, like, yes. what do you have to lose? Right, yeah. <laughs> Put it out. Put it out there. Put it out. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I do get where Kent is coming from as well, because like as a father and they're releasing, you know, video of his son like sitting in his apartment rolling joints, like it that does, I can see how that would feel like, you know, that it is beside the point that they're trying to assassinate his character so or like whatever. Perhaps they should have had a conference with Kent and yeah. like said, Hey, this is what's happening. We're not doing this to dismiss your son or diminish what who he was or assassinate his character or whatever. But this is the evidence we have. We're putting it out so that we can drum up new leads. Yeah. Yeah. That maybe would have helped. But as you know, you can imagine, I'm sure the relationship by the year mark had already been a bit strained. So that did not happen. Though the parties disagree on exactly what happened to Jason that cold December night, they do all agree that he is likely not coming home alive. But then on July 22nd, 2022, a year and a half after his disappearance, a ray of hope came from the form of a sighting some 1,800 miles away from Luling, Texas. That 
That day, the New York Police Department tweeted that an unidentified white male was found unconscious just after 6.30 a.m. near University and Reservoir Avenues in the Bronx, near the Jerome Park Reservoir. They tweeted a photo of the man who was by then in the hospital on a ventilator. So because he was on the ventilator, I mean, his face was partially obscured. But at first glance, he looked a lot like Jason Landry. Like so much so that on July 27th, a post was made on the Find Jason Landry Facebook page saying, quote, the detectives at the Texas AG's office are in contact with the detectives in New York about Jason. They have already sent the necessary ID information for Jason to New York, end quote. And that post had 1.6 thousand comments on it. Kudos to the law enforcement for being proactive and seeing that and being like, oh, shit, that might be our guy. I mean, I think what it was also because the NYPD tweeted it. And so I think a lot of people who just knew about this case in general was like sending it in. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I get that. But still, like, you know, how many times do we cover cases where cops are just like completely dismissive of this kind of thing? And but here we have a case where cops are like, oh, shit. So here's the tweet. And then if you scroll down a little bit, it'll be a picture of Jason. It's pretty close, right? Yeah. Similar nose bridge. Um, It looks as though the individual on the ventilator versus Jason might have gained some weight. Eye shape looks the same. Uh, Like the face shape looked the same for the most part, I thought. Yeah, for the most part. I mean... it was similar enough that, I mean, I can see why people who saw the tweet and knew about this case were like, holy shit, like we yeah, need to no, check this out. Absolutely. I, the the shape of the nose is what really, uh, to me, yeah. drove it. Like they, it's very similar. So unfortunately, it was determined that the man wasn't Jason Landry. But thankfully, he was identified as being from Yonkers, New York, which is much closer to the Bronx than Texas. And the man's family was notified. Well, that's good, though. Yeah. December 2022 marked two years since Jason Landry was last seen. And Kent Landry was speaking out more against the investigation, telling KHOU, quote, It just feels like your child is discarded because they treat everything with this investigation with such indifference. You don't even secure the evidence, whatever it might be. You don't secure the car and the crash scene for further investigation. You don't even do the basics. That is your job, end quote. Yeah, and I I agree. Like, uh, okay, even if you're the first officer on scene and you see this accident, but there's no evidence of like weirdness or foul play or whatever, and you're assuming that it's just, Somebody got into an accident, ran, abandoned car, right? Yeah. Sure. Impound the car. But why would you leave all of the person's belongings literally in the middle of the fucking street? That was the weirdest thing to me. I still cannot figure out the thought process. I don't know either. Possibly even leaving the person's wallet in his backpack on the side of the road. And the wallet I am unsure about, but he definitely left the laptop in there. And the drugs. <laughs> At the absolute very least, if that was your thought process as a first officer on scene, that you're just going to impound this car because it's an abandoned vehicle. I mean, you say it on the body cam footage. You believe the person is naked because his clothes are there and his backpack is there. Pick all that shit up and put it in the car. That's yeah. at least some level of preserving the evidence or even if you're not thinking preserve the evidence let's get out of the road somebody's gonna come back for that yeah for that car so put his shit in the car yeah it just it, it that, i don't understand the thought process of like leaving the dude's slides in yeah. the middle of the road that's completely bizarre to me no it is it's very it's weird Abel Pena was still working with the Landrys and elaborated on some of the reasons he still believed that Jason may have been the victim of a violent crime. Quote, I think the biggest red flags for us initially were the clothes just being laid where they were placed. The more we examined it, the more we ran it by some of our team. We all agreed that it appeared like it was staged, end quote. 
And Pena also said that witnesses had also raised doubts about whether or not Jason was the one behind the wheel when the car crashed. He also points out the weirdness of Jason turning off Waze and switching to Snapchat shortly before he reached that intersection of Austin Street and Magnolia Avenue. Once he reached that intersection, his cell phone usage stopped. So in his mind, it stopped then because something happened to him. And it should be noted that the intersection in question is a busy area and is known for drug and criminal activity. Pena says that the, quote, misturn is also an important piece of the puzzle. Jason's car traveled for four miles in the wrong direction down a pitch black dirt road, apparently without him realizing he was not heading the correct way. He also echoes Kent's concerns about the accident scene and how it wasn't secured. The totaled car was towed immediately without any processing. The sheriff's department didn't take possession of it until five days later. And by that point, they had already pretty much decided that foul play wasn't involved. Unfortunately for the Landry family, the attorney general's office did not agree with their assessments. On December 14th, 2022, they released a statement updating the public on their reinvestigation of Jason's case. It turns out that they were able to get a geofence warrant, actually, like, which I found shocking. Oh, wow. That is crazy. My guess is that because it came from the attorney general's cold case unit, they were able to get a judge to sign off fairly easily. Yeah. But still, they actually got the warrant. The statement they released reads in part, quote, OAG's cold case and missing persons unit has conducted a thorough review of all previously known credible information, interviewed multiple witnesses, consulted with experts in digital forensics and accident reconstruction, and obtained a geofence search warrant near the area where Mr. Landry's vehicle was found. Based upon this extensive review and the evidence known at this point, the OAG supports the conclusions previously stated by the Caldwell County Sheriff's Office. Mr. Landry appears to have been involved in a single car accident, and there is no evidence to suggest that another vehicle was involved. The search warrant yielded no activity near the crash site and did not provide any additional information. Additionally, nothing has been found on Mr. Landry's social media, cell phone, or other electronic devices to suggest that he knew or was planning to meet anyone in Luling, including the lack of credible information pertaining to the purchase or sale of narcotics, end quote. And so that was another kind of part of the foul play theory is that he had Um, Instead of something happening like a carjacking, he had stopped there on purpose to buy drugs uh, because that was an area in which you could do it. But on that episode of Never Seen Again that I talked about, Jeff uh, Ferry, and this is before, you know, they had done a lot of this investigation because that came out about a year after his disappearance. And this is two years after. But even at that point, he's like, from what everybody knows, Jason didn't know anybody in Luling. Like, he had never actually stopped there before in his life. Like, it doesn't seem likely to me that he would just randomly drive to some intersection and just go up to a stranger and be like, hey, you have any drugs? Like, that's generally just not what a kid like that would be doing. Right. And now we fast forward to a year after him saying that and geofencing. So then it would have been compounded with him going up to somebody and that certain person getting into his car, not having a cell phone. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You're right. Because there were no cell phones around Jason's cell phone on the road where the car crashed at the time of the crash. I mean, look, all theories aside, I I mean, like the the reality is is like everybody's got a, a cell phone. Yeah. Because even if, that person took the car and Jason wasn't in the car at the crash site, then yeah, you're right. I mean, that still means he wouldn't have had a cell phone. Right. Whether Jason was in the car or not that. Yeah. Right. So I'm sorry that that evidence right there just to me proves the theory that it yeah. was an accident. And, and the thing with the the clothing being staged, like I can't believe, like I have a hard time believing that 
somebody is going to know enough about paradoxical undressing in order to think like, hey, I'm going to scatter these items of clothing near this crash site. So people think that he had hypothermia and then had a hot flash. And like, that just seems a little too elaborate for me. Now, that statement also says that they're not completely giving up. After concluding their investigation, the OAG turned over all locational and cell phone data to an independent expert who is analyzing it for any information that may have been missed by investigators. They have also asked the Texas Railroad Commission investigators to thoroughly search oil tanks and review operational reports to look for any irregularities in the reservoir tanks. So far, nothing has been found. And it should be noted again that there are a lot of oil tanks in this area, and that is something that was brought up early on. And Captain Ferry said that it would take about two years um, just on their normal schedule for all of those to just kind of empty out and recirculate. So, you know, at that point earlier on in the investigation, they think, yes, he could be in there, but it's going to be a while before we can figure it out. But now it has been two years and there's still no indication that he's in any of those places. The Landry's, of course, have also not given up. They have doubled the reward for information in Jason's disappearance to $20,000 and have set up a GoFundMe to raise more money for the reward and to cover the costs of search efforts. And we've linked that in the show notes for you. Yeah, I mean, what's what's really baffling is that the evidence like overwhelmingly supports the initial investigator's theory. He still shouldn't be that far away though. Well, yeah, no. Like that, that's but, what's so bonkers. And the investigators also they, they're con, they are confused by that as well. Yeah. Like they don't have an answer for that. I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That that it's it's baffling. The Jason Landry case is an excellent example of a family who has acted as the squeaky wheel since the beginning in hopes of getting answers for their son. While those answers have yet to come, their hard work has ensured that Jason is not forgotten and that his disappearance is being thoroughly investigated, something that every missing person deserves, but too few actually receive. Jason Landry has been missing from Luling, Texas since December 13th, 2020. At the time of his disappearance, he was six foot one and 170 pounds. Jason has brown hair, brown eyes, and a goatee. He has scars on his left ankle and on the right side of his neck. He was 21 years old when he went missing. He would be 23 today. If you have any information regarding Jason Landry's disappearance, please contact the Caldwell County Sheriff's Office at 512 398 Six seven seven seven, or the anonymous tip line at 726-777-1359. You can also email the Texas Attorney General's Cold Case Unit at coldcaseunit at oag.texas.gov. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it! <laughs>